So at one point in Jesus' ministry, he sees a blind man and he asks him, what do you want? He sees him and he says, what do you want? Different point, he, he sees a lame man who can't walk and he says, do you want to be healed? <laughs> now, if you at all believe in Jesus, I think you'd probably agree that Jesus knows better than us. So it's fascinating that when you look at Jesus' ministry, how many times he invites people to ask. He invites people to speak to him. He could look at somebody and say, this is what they need, you know, here's what they need, you know, cast a little, you know, do a little miracle. But he actually seeks people out and invites them to, to put to words their request, their need, to say, yes, I need this. The blind man says, I wish to receive my sight. The lame man wishes to walk. And so what this lays out for us is this really interesting pattern throughout all of scriptures where God invites people to talk to him. And so today, as we continue this series of destroying distractions, we're looking at this busy world we live in, and we're in a a part of this series where we're looking at spiritual disciplines, rhythms, habits, disciplines in our life that God invites us to, to help draw us closer to him and to live the life he's called us to live. So last week we talked about meditation and the digesting of God's word, um, chewing on it, sitting with it, allowing it to have its way with us, taking it in. Today we're talking about prayer, which always feels like a funny one to me because sometimes it's like the most obvious things. Um, You feel like you don't need to talk about it, and yet they're sometimes the most crucial, right? Kind of like eating. You don't really get taught how to eat or you don't think about it. And yet sometimes, you know, like I think I shared this last week, I eat too fast, and so it's helpful for me to learn. You got to eat slower. So with prayer, it's something similar. It's something that you just kind of pick up. It's something that we, we sometimes have an intuition on, and yet it can be beneficial to actually sit with and reflect on what is prayer? Why do we do this? When do we pray? How do we pray? All of these questions. And so today as we continue this series and we're talking about prayer today, I want to actually just answer those questions. Here's what I want to guide us today. The classic like English six questions, right? Who, what, where, when, how, when. So I want to talk about what is prayer? Why do we pray? Who should pray? When do we pray? Where do we pray? Those are kind of lumped together. And then finally I want to talk about how we pray. Now from the outset, right, this is one of those This is going to be filled with, there's a lot of right answers, right? So this is not, I want you to leave here thinking like, I need to pray exactly like he does or she does, and I need to say these words exactly right in this position because then the magic unlocks, right? But I think that reflecting on these things can be beneficial as we, especially live in such a busy world that's demanding our time and attention, to stop and ask, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? How, when am I doing this? And so on. So to start off, I want to talk about First question, what is prayer? Um, We'll look at a scripture passage here, but here's what I want to start off by saying. Prayer is not voodoo. (laughs) Prayer is not magic. It was kind of an old folklore idea that if you knew some divine creature's name, you had power over it. And so by having a name, you could get it to do whatever you wanted to. Uh, Prayer is not that. Anyone who, who has been a Christian can probably attest you have prayers that did not get magically done the way you wanted them to do. And the Bible's filled with these too. Or people pray something, God, please do this, and it doesn't happen. And so right off the bat, we need to establish this isn't voodoo, this isn't magic, it isn't like, oh, if you just prayed, it would have absolutely happened the way you want it to. And yet, it's this broad thing that God invites us to do. So if you look at 1 Timothy, here's multiple categories of prayer that Paul writes to Timothy. Is, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. So you have this broad category. It's all these different things. Sometimes this acronym gets um, used for SPIT, if you ever want an idea of different things you can pray for. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. So supplications, God, I, I need this. Prayers, God, please do this. Intercessions on behalf of somebody. And then thanksgivings, God, thank you for this. And so right away we see that this is a broad category. This isn't specific, like, well, this is a prayer, that's not a prayer. Um, prayer is more broadly just a conversation with God. Prayer is speaking to God, bringing both thanksgivings and requests. So this is why this one of all the disciplines is so instrumental because like what we're gonna, some of the disciplines we'll talk about in the future, they can be helpful and I'll, I'll encourage you to try them. But prayer is foundational to the life of a Christian and actually it's foundational to living as a human being the right way. Any human being is meant to be in conversation with the God who made them. If you look at the Garden of Eden, you have God walking with Adam and Eve, and they're just talking, right? This picture of this, this 
unmitigated relationship. And so prayer is simply speaking to God, right? Bringing both thanksgivings. Hey, God, thanks for doing that. And also, hey, God, could you please do this? And it's a broad, it's a broad category, but I think that's helpful um, because it, it helps us think beyond just, all right, if I'm in this position, this is prayer. It's just talking to God. Any conversation. And so that's how it was always meant to be, from the garden, prayer, speaking to God, and we can bring him everything, thanksgivings and requests. All right, that one's pretty straightforward. This one's a little bit more dense. Why pray? So if, if prayer is just conversation with God, why should we talk to God? Well, I'm going to give you one example, or one reason, and I'm going to start with this one intentionally first, because God says so. <laughs> right? It's the classic, if you're a parent, you're told, like, you know, get a better reason than because I said so. When God says because I said so, it, just take it, okay? It's always the right thing to do. Right? So this is the, the will of God we just read in First Timothy. The will of God is that these things are happening in the Christian's life. Um, and part of the reason why I start with this is it's a command to pray to God. It's something he wants you to do. Is there are times when you don't feel like praying to God or you don't feel worthy of praying to God? And it's helpful to remind ourselves, God says so. If it's just a gift, well, I, I don't know if I deserve that gift. But if God's like, I want you to talk to me right now, okay. So it's a command of God. And if you think about it, any parent will tell you they like talking to their kids, right? When you went off to college, your parents might have said, hey, call once in a while, right? It's, it's a command, but it's also for your good. And as we look at, um, I want to look at a passage in James where he talks about how powerful this is and part of the reason why we're praying. This is as James is closing up his letter to the Christian church. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as, is, as it is working. And he gives an example here. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So James, if you're familiar with his letter, he has all these things that he's going on. Hey, you need to, your faith should actually do something. It should show fruit. Um, all these different concerns about how people speak. But he closes out his letter talking about prayer. If anyone's suffering, pray. Things are going good, sing praises, which is, again, if it's talking to God, it's, it's a form of prayer. If anyone's among you sick, let them call the elders of the church. So, so bring together the church, bring the leaders, everybody. Have them pray over that person in the name of the Lord. And then James makes this assertion, right? Says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. So when we think about why we pray, one of the reasons we pray is because it actually has power to do something. Now immediately, here's where the tension comes in, right? It's not voodoo magic. It's not I pray and it happens. And it has power. So if Jesus knows everything, he, he, he knows way better than we do, why does he ask people to bring their request? This is one of those tensions that doesn't neatly resolve. Because God, we're told in Scripture, is unchangeable. He's infinite knowledge. He knows the future. It's all in his hands. And yet if you look throughout the whole Bible, what you see is God responding to prayer and it would seem even changing his mind. Does God know what he's going to do, or does he respond to us? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Christian faith. But one of the things that James wants to, James wants to stress, and this, the narratives of Scripture, Abraham does this too. Elijah, the example, right? Elijah prayed, hey God, stop, stop all the rain. And God stops it on Elijah's behalf, his prayer. All right, God, I need you to make it rain. And God makes it rain. But prayer actually has power. This is what God reveals over and over and over again. That when we pray, it actually has something to change something. We actually have the ability to bring something to God that can change reality. And this is one of the beautiful things on why we pray is a lot of times we feel, feel helpless in circumstances. There's so many things in this world that we cannot change on our own might or will. Sometimes it's, it's internal. Sometimes I can't even change much about me. And yet God promises that when we pray, it has power. 
and it can actually change things. In Elijah's case, it changed the weather. It can change hearts and minds of of world leaders. It can change people's hope in this world. It can change even who we are in our broken, sinful state. And so one of the reasons that why we pray is because we're being given this gift that is powerful. We're being given this, this tool, this blessing, to actually come to the God who holds everything and actually influence it. So if you have like a world leader, right, they have like a cabinet, like these are the people who get a seat at their table to like say, hey, you know, I've been talking to the people of this region, I think we should maybe enact this policy. And this is one of the reasons why we pray, is it's a gift to get to sit at God's cabinet, right? To have a seat at the table and say, hey God, you know, I was looking around and I think this person could really use you, right? My neighbor who's going through a lot, could you please just calm their heart a little bit? Like how amazing. And this is a part of the gift you think of in the garden, right? Adam and Eve are walking with God. They're talking with him. And then all of a sudden, sin enters the world and this relationship is broken. And part of the good news is, of Jesus is that when he went to the cross and he rose from the dead, that cross became a bridge to restore that relationship. All of a sudden, this separation of God and heaven and, and people on earth was shattered and, and heaven came down and all of a sudden, the conversation starts up again. Like a broken relationship. So why we pray? We pray because God wants us to as a parent. um, We pray because it has power and we pray because it's a gift. What a beautiful blessing that we don't have to sit with the burdens of this world in our own hands. When I'm going through something, when I'm I'm stressed, when I'm wondering how in the world is this going to resolve, we can pray. Say, God, I I give this to you because I can't fix it. I remember I went on a trip um, to Israel a handful of years ago and when we were over there, there was um, we got to hear from a lot of different people about the current conflict, and this was before some of the even recent developments. But I remember I was just getting so overwhelmed by it. At one point, we were, I was kind of debriefing with some friends, and I was just like, I don't know how in the world, what, what's going to happen? And one of my friends was like, PJ, that's why you're not God. Please give it to him. <laughs> and it's amazing, though. We get, we get so caught up and, and overwhelmed by what's happening that we forget that that's one of the blessings. God has actually given us a chance to come to him and say, God, I can't fix this, but you can. I'm going to give it to you. And and trust that it has great working. Doesn't mean you automatically get what you want. And yet we can trust it's going to do something. And God can do something with it. So what is prayer? It's conversation with God. Why do we pray? He commands it. It's a gift. It has power. Um, Who, when, where? Okay. Answer everywhere, right? Um, Answer all the time. In actuality, though, this is from 1 Thessalonians. This is Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So again, this is the will of God. He, he wants you to do it, um, but it's good. So always rejoice, without ceasing, pray, and give thanks in all circumstances. So the short answer is when, where, all the time, wherever you're at, as long as you're a Christian, you have this opportunity to pray. Now, I want to get real specific here. So this means, right, so if if prayer is conversation with God, this is one of the beautiful things. When you go back to that garden image, the people just walking with God. So I'm walking down the street, and I see something cool. It's a really pretty flower. I can just say, God, thanks. Right? I don't need to, it doesn't need to be prayer time. It's just, ha, God. As I'm just sitting there thinking, as I'm going into a meeting, and I'm not sure how this is going to go, I can just say, God, bless this meeting all the time. And so it's just a life. And And this is where, again, when we think about routines, um, there are people in there, um, that we go to when we're stressed. Like for some of us, it's like a sibling. Like I know people who it's like my sister is the person. Like whenever something comes up, I call my sister to talk about it. And the same way as we build this routine and talking to God, it's whenever something comes up, I'm just, it's just a habit to say, God, thank you. Or God, please help this. So it, it's this every all present, wherever we're at, opportunity. This is the beautiful thing about God's omnipresence, that he's everywhere, is that you're never apart from God. You don't need to quickly run to your prayer room. You're right there. However, there are helpful times where we routinely gather or we build into our life as prayer, of prayer. So for instance, as you'll notice, every Sunday we pray. All right, so one of the blessings is to pray with other Christians. And so we on Sunday, when we're going to gather around God's word, we are going to pray. If you ever come here and you get out of here and we didn't pray, please I was going to say punch me in the face. Maybe don't do that, but let me know. Raise a little hand or something. Um, No, stop. 
But it's one of the things that we do together, one of the things we do corporately. It's one of our responsibilities to the world around us is we're going to pray for this world and ask God to take care of it. We're going to pray for the needs of one another. We're going to give God thanks and praise. Um, You do this also, this is where, again, a lot of this stuff is not mandatory but helpful, right? So when Paul talks about not all, all things are permissible, that doesn't mean all things are beneficial. That could summarize a lot of spiritual disciplines. There's a lot of ways to do this. So part of our challenge is reflecting on what is the most helpful. So when do you pray? Um, who do you pray with? This is where I find it very helpful to have a bit of a routine. So for me personally, I pray in the morning, and if I miss that, sometimes I'll be like, I'm just going to quickly do these things, and I'll get back to prayer. I almost always never come back. I <laughs> just like blow past it. We're such creatures of habit. So it is helpful when you think of when to pray. You can pray at any point, any time, all circumstances, but also building in time where I know this is where discipline comes in, where this is a time to pray. As a family, this is, this is one of the reasons why um, a lot of times churches will have like household like morning prayers and evening prayers or meal prayers, right? So there's a routine to it. I know one family, they pray every time they drive. So it's before you back out of the driveway, we say a prayer. And they'll ask, you know, hey, which kid wants to pray today? Um, but the, I, the, the mom was telling me one time, they actually started, she was flustered. She's like, we got to get somewhere. And she put in the card in reverse, started to back up. And the kid goes, stop. She's like, what? We didn't pray. It's like, Okay. But that's the power of routine. God, bless this trip, bless anything else on their mind. So having a routine, routine, so here's when I'm going to pray, right? Again, you can pray at any time, but this is just part of the conversation, right? This is part of building into the habitus, the habit of a life of prayer. I'll say this too, this is where occasions are are helpful. There's times when um, things pop up that hopefully we can can help ourselves realize this is a chance to pray. So something good happens, you have a really cute moment with a kid or um, you're at work and that meeting you're just stressed about goes really well. Those are, can be signals. Hey, this is a great chance to thank God. Or if something tragic happens and or something overwhelms you, you hear news about something, building in the habit of when I hear an occasion to pray, whether it's good or bad, to pray, right? So again, these are all not mandatory. You don't have to have a, a specific morning prayer. All these routines and stuff can look different. But thinking about when creating patterns, and thinking about these different times when we might want to do so. Again, all the time, but also helpful to set aside specific times. Um, Whenever we gather, this is where um, plans can help us focus. Another occasion to help prayer is, again, Scripture. So this is when last week we talked about meditation and digesting God's Word. One of the beautiful things is when you sit with God's Word, you think about um, what He has said, and then you get to respond in prayer. So you think about... uh, a passage of scripture, and that leads you to, all right, God, I've gotten to hear from you. Now I want to thank you, or I want to ask for help in this. So it's part of the the ongoing conversation, which again, we do here on Sunday mornings, but we get to flow out into every part of our life. So that is who, when, and where. So I want to close out with talking about how to pray. So here's where there's not a a right answer. There's not really a wrong answer. Um, And yet, it's a worthy question asking, because if you think about it, and we'll look at this passage in a second, we do the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And that passage, the reason why Jesus shares the Lord's Prayer is because the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray. And he doesn't say, no, you already got it. He says, no, I'll teach you. And so it's helpful to think about how we pray. Again, not one right answer, um, but a lot of helpful things. And so I I just want to highlight a few different aspects. One is, is posture. Again, not one right answer. But if you've noticed, there's times when you might be sitting and praying. There's times where you might kneel and pray. There's times where you might be standing and praying. There's, you could fold your hands. You could open your eyes. You can close your eyes. You can bow your head. Um, and all of those, what those are doing are, are different aspects. They're helping you to embody what you're doing. So when I bow my head, as we sang, I'm reminding myself that I need the Lord, that he is my Lord. And I'm folding my hands. It's, it's maybe sometimes so I'm not fidgeting too much. But you could grab like some some beads or something to, to kind of hold on to while you're, you're praying. Um, you could have your eyes closed so you're not seeing stuff, or you could be looking at Scripture or a picture of Jesus or um, something. It could be helpful. Or if you're going for a walk and you're looking around at the world as you're praying for it. So posture is something where this is what's really cool is it's unique for everybody, and yet you can find what helps me in this conversation. Especially as we talk about a world full of distractions, um, there's a lot of things that are trying to take our attention, so are there practices that I can implement to help me with the distractions. So I'll just, here's just a personal anecdote. 
I find it helpful to be kneeling because when I'm kneeling, I'm less likely to wander off in my thoughts. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the ache in my knees that's like reminding me what I'm doing. Um, I'll tell you the worst place for me to pray. And I used to, like, this is, my prayers used to always be in bed at night. Um, and I still, some, you know, again, sometimes I'll be in bed and I'll remember something and I'll pray. Um, but I knew it was bad when one time I was having a really restless sleep and I, like, couldn't fall asleep. And I was like, if I started praying, I bet I would fall asleep right now. It was just, I had such a, a terrible pattern of, if I'm praying at night, I'm just going to doze off. Like, that's just the pattern. So, thinking, are, are there things that I can do in how I um, posture myself that help? Not one right answer, but are there things that I can be doing very practically um, to help assist in my goal? If my goal is conversation with God, if my goal is to bring the needs of myself and my loved ones and the people around me to give God thanks and praise, how does my posture reflect that, right? Do I want to put my arms out so I can symbol that I'm receiving good gifts from God? Do I want to bow my head so I can remind myself that I am um, just a worthy, worthy, not even worthy to be a peasant in his kingdom, and yet I'm here as his child. And to think about those, those various aspects of what we're doing. Um, I will say this with distractions. Um, if you're like me, as soon as you start praying, there's a good chance your mind wanders. You're praying for your coworker, and all of a sudden that reminds you of something else at work, and you start thinking about this. Um, one way to, to redeem distractions in prayer is actually to, to pray for them. So I'm praying, you know, for my parents, and all of a sudden that reminds me of like, oh yeah, I got to get that family vacation figured out. And so now it's a chance, God, bless that vacation. Bless that trip. Um, help me not to get too frantic or, or nervous or stressed about it. Um, bless the people we're going to see. Help us to be a blessing to those that we're going to see. And so all of a sudden, the reason why our minds jump to all these things sometimes is because our brains make all these different connections. And so when I start thinking about one thing, my brain jumps to something else. And what an opportunity to pray for that thing, right? And to view those things actually as a joy and a, and a, a privilege to get to pray for I read about this convent a while back of these nuns, and what was so remarkable is this um, secular newspaper did an article on them, and the, uh, the journalist was not Christian, but was blown away because whenever they would get a prayer request, they, they'd advertise in the newspaper, hey, we'd love prayer requests. It wasn't just like, oh, cool, we got a prayer request. They would celebrate. Praise the Lord, we have something else we can pray for. And so viewing distractions that way too, it, all of a sudden my brain runs off to something else I never even thought of, and it's like, wow, now I have a chance to pray for this thing that I didn't even realize I could pray for. So, so redeeming those distractions in that way. Um, in terms of, of what we pray for too, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer here, but um, I will encourage you, I find it helpful to pray both extemporaneously, just with my own words, um, God, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling, help this. And I also find it helpful, just personally, to supplement also with prayers that other people have written. So that could be prayers from Scripture. So I, I highly encourage you to check out what Paul prays for. What are the things that Paul cares about? Um, what are the, the prayers in the Old Testament and Jesus' works? Um, if you have a prayer book, you can just Google colics. If you ever, like, you have something coming up, like Memorial Day, is like colic for Memorial Day. And I'm sure there's people who have written prayers on these things. One of the things I find helpful about that is they give me words that I would otherwise not think to speak. And they give me things to pray for that I otherwise would not think to pray for. Now again, I still pray extemporaneously too. It's just, I find those a helpful combination. And so I encourage you to check that out. If you need resources, a prayer book or something like that, um, let me know. But I find that a helpful supplement in how we pray. One of the places you can look too, if you're, if you're ever curious of, of what to pray for, is John 17. One of the remarkable things, we talk about Jesus and he invites people to ask him questions, and invites people to come to him, is Jesus himself does pray to his father as well. And I find it fascinating what he prays for. So if you're familiar, Jesus says last night when he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be handed over and going to get crucified. All right, so there's the one that we, we probably, most of us know very well. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, Lord, let this cup pass, but not my will, but your will. But also in John 17, we have recorded what's called the high priestly prayer, where Jesus actually spends his final night on earth before he's died, before he's killed, praying for his disciples and praying for you. Jesus, with everything, the, the whole weight of the world coming upon himself, he spent time praying for you. He prays for his disciples and, and says, Father, I've not lost any of those that you've committed to me, and I'm also praying for those who will believe because of their words, you and me. And I pray that, Father, they would be one like you and I are one and that your love might be known amongst them. How beautiful that Jesus, again, with, with all things in his hands, said, you know what, before I die, I need to spend time praying for you and for me. 
so that they might know the love of God. And then he would go, again, making that bridge between heaven and earth just shortly later, amplifying, showing God's love by dying on a cross, sacrificing himself, and then rising victoriously. So again, it's one, way, one place to look for. I encourage you to, to look at these places. Um, but I want to, as we reflect on this, close out, I want to go to Jesus' own words. When the disciples ask this question in Luke 11, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say. So again, this is in response to a question, Jesus, how do we pray? Can you teach us? John the Baptist, his disciples were taught. Um, And so this is a chance for us too to be reminded this is a teaching prayer. And so I'm going to highlight, I want you to take note, so First off, this is a prayer that we say verbatim every Sunday, and it's good, and it's, it's a great unifying prayer for the church. But it's also, Jesus is teaching what to pray for, how to pray, right? How do we pray? When you pray, say these things. Pray about these things. So, just looking at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven. Now, first off, that's not a request, but that's just the opening. Again, this is where it's, it's amazing. If you think about Jesus as the king, you're at his cabinet, and we get to invite, call upon him as our own father, right? As children, um, if you ever feel like, man, I don't know if you've ever, you probably, well, if you're like me, you felt this. Um, again, when you don't feel worthy to go into God and you're like, man, I haven't even, like sometimes you, you realize so much later, like I should have been praying this whole time and I didn't. You almost feel guilty now, like bringing it up, like I don't deserve it. This is where Jesus and the prodigal son is so helpful when he tells the story about the son who swears off his dad, dad, you're as good as dead to me, goes off, blows all of his money, lives a terrible life. And then he comes back thinking, like, maybe if I beg, I can become a servant. And his father sprints to him, right? When we come to God, it's like a father who sees his, his child. He's never going to be like, oh, man, you again? Um, this perfect, loving father. And so we get to come to God as a father. Hallowed be your name, right? This is one of the beautiful things. Kind of like Sabbath. God's name is holy by itself, right? You can't make God's holy, name holy or not. And yet what we're praying for, and what Jesus is teaching us to pray for, is that we would live a life that treats God's name as the holy thing it is. And this is where name is a really big thing. So this is how we speak. How do I speak about God? God, help me to speak in a way that, that treats you as the holy, divine, wonderful God that you are. Um, but you think about what it means to bear somebody's name, right? So if you, family, you, you know, share a last name, you have the family name, how you live affects the name, right? So this is where, like, uh, in a lot of cultures, if there's a kid who's like, doing something crazy, it brings shame upon the whole name, right? The family name. And so part of this is if in baptism, God's name is put upon you, we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, everything we do in life reflects on this name. Because when you go out, you're not just going as Joe Schmo, you're going out as Christian, going out as baptized by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're praying, how can we live and speak in a way that brings holy and honor, holiness and honor to God's name? So notice again, this is, we say these words, hallowed be your name, but when you're praying, this is something you can just take. Take the Lord's Prayer and just walk through it. Hallowed be your name. And then pause and reflect. Pray. God, here's what I have coming up. Help me make your name holy when I step into this arg- family argument that I'm about to deal with. Help me live in a way when I go to that little neighborhood barbecue that people see it and say, wow, this is somebody who's been marked by somebody holy. So hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Same thing. Jesus is king. His kingdom is going to come on its own. And we're praying, Lord, we're asking for your kingdom to come here. We prayed it earlier, but one of the things I found very helpful by a a guy named Don Everett is he encourages you, whatever neighborhood you're in, whatever city you're in, um, to occasionally pray this part, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, but pray it with your neighborhood or your city. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in Denver as it is in heaven. Because your kingdom is going to come, Jesus, but we're praying that it might come here and amongst us, that we might live in a way that you rule and you reign. And your will be done. So this is, again, too, this is where the tricky thing about prayer is ultimately, if God is all-knowing, we want his will to be done. So there's this tension of I'm bringing requests, and I'm also saying, God, but ultimately, whatever you desire, do that. This is exactly what Jesus, what Jesus models. Again, when he's in the garden, and he's about to take a cup, and it's a figure to... Uh, uh, figurative image for the wrath that is deserved by all of humanity. And he's going to take it. He says, God, if there's a way for this cup to pass, 
take it away, but not my will but yours. So that's the posture with every prayer we come to is, is God, I'm going to bring you all these things, but at the end of the day, I want you to do your will. I want you, I want you to help me with this, but ultimately I want you to do what's best. So your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And so this is, again, where Jesus is actually inviting us, teaching us to pray for what we need. Lord, I need to eat today. Please give me food. Lord, I need the patience to get through today. Give me patience, right? Lord, I, I need shelter. I need whatever it might be. Um, but whatever we need for today. This is, again, where it's implied that this is a, a daily rhythm because I'm asking not for, hey, God, I really need food for five years from now or I need, give me what I need for today. And so when you get to this part of walking through your own prayers, you can say, give us this day our daily bread and reflect. What do I need today? What, is, what, is, what do I need to call upon God to provide? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so this is a two-parter, right? So we're asking God, forgive me. This is an acknowledgement. And this is where you can pause and reflect and confess, God, I've sinned in these ways. Please forgive me. And help me to forgive those who have sinned against me. It's just a part of a package deal. This is, again, where forgiveness does not come naturally to human beings. It's not, it's not something we just instinctively do. And so, God, give me the strength. Give me your blessing to forgive. Lead us not into temptation. Um, the Bible says itself, God himself does not lead us into temptation. He's not going to tempt us. And yet, there are all sorts of things that are. So we're asking God, protect me from temptation. Protect me from the things that would pull me away from you. And deliver us from evil. All the evil in this world. The devil's forces. Right? My own sinful nature. The influences around me. And so this is all a chance to fill in categories. Like these are headers that we can take and just say, daily bread, what do I need? Trespasses, oof, how have I sinned? Who sinned against me that I'm harboring resentment? Not into temptation. Here's the temptations I'm facing right now I need help from. Here's the evil that I'm, I'm confronting. So if, if nothing else, when you pray, I encourage you to look at the Lord's Prayer. When the, the moment when the d- disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray, he says, here it is. This is a gift and invitation, right? Because ultimately, and this is actually not in the biblical account, but this is what the church has added as a kind of nice, tidy wrap-up. We pray this every Sunday too. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Because this God, this Jesus, who, who knows everything, who, who, his is the kingdom. He's the king. He rules. His is the power. can do whatever he wants. His is the glory. He's worthy of all honor. And he still comes to you and says, hey, son, daughter, What do you want? What can I do for you? He invites us into this conversation so we might draw closer to him. We might be blessed by him because it's powerful. It's a gift. It's because he loves you. And to restore this conversation, to restore this conversation and this relationship between broken people and a beautiful, perfect God, Jesus said, you know what, to get that back going, I'll do anything. I'll drink this cup of wrath. I'll die on a cross. So brothers and sisters, I just encourage you to take some time today or this week and just think about how am I praying? When am I praying? Are there there things that I want to do? I want to learn more. Um, So that way I can continue this conversation. I can continue to draw, draw closer to the God who loves me, who is willing to do anything to know me, to be with me. This God who says, you know what? I have a kingdom. I have power. I have glory. I want you to share in it. Come, make your request. And in doing so, may his will be done. May his kingdom reign in us, amongst us, everywhere we go. May that life of prayer be yours too. In Jesus' name, amen.